Hey everybody, welcome back to the Linux Cast. I'm your host Matt. I'm joined by Tyler. I didn't do the last names, but I don't care because I can't say my own last name, and it's okay. I can't say my last name. You can't count together. <laughs> we're, we're, we're very good at this. We're, we're having a day. Yes, it's this has not been twenty minutes of fucking around with X Monad to try to get to work with OBS. It just it was a complete failure, and I had to install DWM, so I'm back on DWM. So whatever. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is whatever. It's just not a good day. This is going to be a horrendous podcast. I'm just going to tell you this right now. Uh, we're we're gonna there's gonna I'm just to warn you. There's gonna be so many rabbit holes, and uh, good. you know, just we're we're gonna be going off on tangents for the whole, like the next hour. It's gonna be great. Anyways, or not great, whatever. Um, Tyler, what have you been doing in Linux this week? Well, um, I've actually, um, well, for one, in inside of Linux, I have been using um, IRC, um, a, like just in general now, before I'd never used it. Um, so that's interesting. But um, how I got into using IRC is um, live streaming on Odyssey. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of it. I don't, I don't know if like how long it was, it actually took since live streaming was like announced and in beta, but it's now available for me. And so I've had a couple of live streams and I just did my uh, second one yesterday and that went on for eight hours. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. An eight hour stream. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I did. I, my last live stream on YouTube was two hours and like a few minutes and that was entirely too long for me. I could never do eight hours worth of live streaming. I've done. I here, here's how crazy I am. About a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I did a full twenty four hour stream. That hurt. Like that was. Like I, like I, I oh. the logistics confuse me. Like. Do you get up like halfway through to go get, get lunch or something, or do you have somebody bring you food, or you go to the? I mean, you go to the bathroom obviously eventually, right? Yeah, like throw up a, like a be right back screen and like play some music, and then go to the bathroom, or like I'll, I'll I for that I threw up like an intermission screen and like ate for a little bit and talked and then went back on. I would have on. to have an, an absurd amount of money paid to me to do that. <laughs> After like, doing it. I would too. Oh no no no! I'm getting paid up front, man. <laughs> I want my money up front. There's gonna be no donations afterwards. They can be donations during, but I want the the main part of the cash up front because I otherwise no. I'm I, no. <laughs> uh, I, I don't. Uh, maybe someday I'll eventually I'll take a look at. Uh, I'm just not that into Odyssey. I mean, we talked about this last week. I just not like I put all my videos up there, but. I don't know. Like, I haven't got the audience to interest me or something. I don't know. Um, Maybe you just haven't been discovered yet. And so, uh, he, here's one thing: while we're talking about Odyssey, and I'm thinking about it, the po so these podcasts are not getting transferred over to Odyssey. I, I don't know, know if I you're saw aware that. Of that. I don't know why. Uh, I think it's because they're too long. That might be it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I know Odyssey is fussy. <laughs> I'd have to go through and you know upload them manually, and then you don't get any transcoding like at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know. We'll see how that goes. Maybe you have to have a certain amount of, like, it doesn't make sense. Cause it, it seems like if you have a, the way they do the whole automatic transfer thing is they do it based on like, there's like, levels based on how many followers you have on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, I just went over 2,500 followers. So I would assume that I'm at the process point where they'd actually transfer over something that's an hour long, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, yeah, I noticed that they weren't be getting transferred over. I'll, look into that and see why that's not happening because uh, to be honest i'm pretty sure i'm too lazy to do it manually so i just <laughs> just be honest about it yeah well, um, what have you been up to man um just shoot me now <laughs> <laughs> that, that's been my leak in linux because all right so i'm big on trying out new window managers and i've been trying to use xmonad for probably six months i've tried it off and on over the course of the six months and it's been not a great journey um <laughs> most of the time the reason why i've always switched away from it is because the bar i have bar problems right so xmonad 
has a bar that they prefer you to use with it. It's called Exmo Bar. The first time I tried to use it, I did actually get to show up. Like, that was like months ago. Uh, but I couldn't get my head around Haskell at the time. So I switched back to DWM or whatever it was on the time. And, and just recently I decided, you know what, I'm going to switch to Xmonad again. And I'm going to give it a real go. Like, I'm going to switch to it. That's all I'm going to use for a whole month. Well, first of all, that was a lie. Uh, <laughs> um, soon after doing that video, I switched back to DWM. So I, actually, I did my video the other day on Shotcut in DWM. But that's just because I couldn't get the bar to work. So I, could, I can't get Xmo bar to show up at all. Like, not even a little bit. And I don't know why. Like, it, like it has no clue. I, I even went through and took my custom config that I've been trying to just build myself and downloaded DT's config and tried to use his. That didn't work. So I was like, well, you know what? It's obviously something else is wrong. So I went on Unix porn, found someone else who's been doing Xmo and had downloaded their dot files and used theirs. And there's Xmo, Xmo bar still wouldn't work. Oh. So I don't have any clue what's going on with xmo bar so then yesterday i said you want to fuck it i'm just going to use polybar so and i had polybar working before and you know it was fine but i couldn't edit it like i've made changes to the config file and it wouldn't make any changes like at all so i could like make changes size i can add modules nothing even like restarting um even, Xmo, xmonad even restarting xmonad logging out logging back in shutting the computer down shutting it back on Nothing. It wouldn't change. It wouldn't make any changes to the configuration file at all. It also wasn't reading from the auto start file that I was using. So I don't know what the hell is going on there. It's very weird. Um, <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to distro hop. So I downloaded the latest arch, arch installer or arch ISO. And I was like, you know, what? I'm going to try the new arch installer that come, comes on the, the ISO. Yeah. And it, it worked fine. You know, I got into, mm -hmm. I got into Arch and, you know, managed to install GNOME, which I, I decided on GNOME because uh, it uses GDM by default instead of LightDM. And LightDM does not work with Arch anymore. So I used it for about an hour and it was buggier than shit. <laughs> it was just so buggy. Uh, like I don't know what was going on. I'm assuming I missed some dependencies somewhere along the line and some things were just not, you know working out well so i was like you know what? screw this i'm going back to arco just like i knew i probably would mm -hmm. and so i had the arco installer with x monad on it so it was the the <laughs> arco linux x monad thing and got that in there and it's working fine it's I, I i gave up on x mobar and the polybar in the arco linux one works fine it will it let me edit it and everything and I, i've been using it since last night it was working fine until obviously we decided to do the podcast <laughs> and find out that for whatever reason, the way that OBS goes through and captures the video, you have to have the video on screen all time for OBS to capture it. And that would mean not being able to look at links or anything, you know, while we're doing the podcast. So, uh, long story short, I'm on DWM right now and pretty happy about it. Um, <laughs> so, so, I, I, I'll eventually make a video on Xmonad again. I'm I'm, I'm going to go back to it after we're done here, and you know I'm going to keep trying because you know people say like, oh if you use DWM you'll love Xmonad. So far I haven't been loving Xmonad, but well, see it's great to hear you talk about it because there are like no there's really no one out there like voicing like uh hey I'm having like some real issues setting up and using Xmonad. Everyone's just like it's great. No one oh, talks yeah. about it. It's, yeah, like, a, oh, it was great. I just issues. downloaded DT's configs and popped them in my config folder, and it's perfectly fine. No, that's not the way it works. I'm sorry, it doesn't. Um, or at least that's not the way it worked for me. I mean, I, I'm sure, I'm 100% I'm positive that whatever I'm doing wrong is my problem. Like, this isn't a problem with Xmonad. It's not a problem with Haskell. It's not a problem with DT's configs. It's not a problem with my configs or Arco's configs. It's 100% a me problem, right? Like, me being stupid or a noob somewhere along the line. Or just missing something. Yeah. I mean, there's a dependency or something that I'm just missing. I'm 100% like, I'm sure that that's the case. But that being said, Xmonad's stupid. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it, like I can't, I just, I, I don't, I don't know. It has it's, been. F- what? No, go ahead. Like it has been fun messing around with it, like in troubleshooting it and trying to get it done, but it's also been incredibly frustrating. So, um, I don't know. It's, it, it's going to get another week for me. And if I don't see a benefit to using it another week, I don't know. Cause, yeah. because it, I, I love DWM so much. It's going to have to, X Monad's going to have to be really super great uh, mm. to get me to switch away. And so far, the problems have definitely not made it seem, you know, super great. Yeah. And it, it's, it's fair to talk about it like that. Like, I mean, it, there's just, I, I don't know. To, to me, it's nice to hear someone talking about X Monad and voicing the same. Like, for me, I never even, I never even got into it because I, I mean, like you said, you've run into problems with X Monad. Not only is Haskell a thing, like it's just not not. I mean, it's it's Haskell is honestly just as complicated to get into as getting into DWM is. Like you know, like when you don't know anything about source code or C or anything or like mm-hmm. make file or like how to make programs stuff like that. Like it's just as complicated. Like. So I don't, I, I don't know. Like no one's out there talking about, yeah, I had problems with X monad. You only hear the people who are like, it's fantastic. Yeah. This time around, I've had better luck with Haskell. Cause I, I've, I think, cause when I first tried it, I just started using DWM. So I hadn't learned very much about DWM and I hadn't had months of experience going through and trying to figure out how to patch things and, you know, learning a little bit of C and tinkering and stuff like that so i have more experience with the learning languages now so i I had a much easier time with haskell i will say this haskell is way better than lua so (laughs) i had i had a hell of a time now you gotta remember i only spend like uh, two hours or something like that with it but when i installed awesome there on its stream uh lua is (laughs) just i mean I it I can't <laughs> I can't get my head around Lua and like everybody says like Lua is better easier than uh, Haskell but I don't think that that's true. Um, now I would take C over Haskell or Lua any day. Um, yeah. And C is a weird program language too. So um, honestly, the 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 language I prefer out of all of them is Qtile. Uh, with mm-hmm. that uses P- uses Python. Yeah, and I agree. The my problem with Qtile is that you can only have nine window man, window workspaces. Now, there's somebody in the comments that's going to say, well, Matt, I've told you four times now you can do more than nine workspaces. <laughs> I can't figure it out, okay? I've Googled it, okay? Google ha- says there's not. So, and also, fuck you, phone. Google. <laughs> <laughs> Google's listening. <laughs> well, um. It's it, it's funny because like as vocal as I am about loving Qtile, I mean I'm on DWM right now. I I do I since I've started using DWM, I really have just fallen in love because as long as you don't over patch it, as long as you're as you like as long as you like DWM with just maybe one or two patches in there, mm-hmm. it's fantastic. Yeah, you patch have, it twice and done. Yeah, I think I have five patches. And that's really as many as you want to patch it. Like mm-hmm. Five is really kind of pushing it. Like, there are two more patches that I really, really want. I want to be able to go through and have key bindings for every single workspace that I have. All 18 of them. Uh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a patch for that. And I also would like to go through and have it so that each workspace has, like, its own icon or own name or whatever. Uh-huh. And um, I can't get them to patch. I, they just... Even going through and manually adding the code in, like manually patching them, I can't get it done. Um, now, I'm assuming if I went through and like did those patches first, mm-hmm. you know, like with a fresh install, I could probably yeah. get it done. But then I'd have to leave out some of the other patches that I like, you know, always center or attach yeah. to the bottom or whatever. And, you know, and those things are more important to me than, you know, just adding an extra key binding to switch monitors. Yeah. So <laughs> it was a lot of you want, there. you want, like 18 dedicated shortcuts for for switching through your workspaces okay so one of the best parts about i3 i like i love i3 it was my first window manager and on uh, in i3 i have super one through through zero attached to all the workspaces on the first monitor and then i have control one through zero to have for all of the workspaces on the second monitor. So I okay, have, that's pretty smart. I have twenty workspaces in i three, and it's so easy to add them in i three. Like I wish it was that way in every single work, you know, window manager. But it's just you know, 
Super one through zero changes it on nine, and and super, and just adding the shift key will move the windows around. Yeah. Same same uh, key combinations. It's just it, it's easily the one thing I miss most about i three. Um, so there, there's a good chance eventually I'll be switching back to i three, but I still do like DWM. That is actually like at first I was very much like, really you want that many key bindings for all your works like for all the workspaces on all the monitors for the, then after you explain it, I'm like, wait, that makes a ton of sense. Like yeah. let's see. the thing I, I know that's going to keep me from using X Monet. So let's just say I go through and really like X Monet. You know, I learned the Haskell enough to actually get by. I figure out my bar problems and I go through and rice it. The thing that's going to keep me from using X Monet is the fact that there's only nine workspaces. Um, that's yeah. the thing that drives me away from Qtile. It's the thing that's driven me away from uh, probably Xmonad. I, I I did that poll on on the channel not too long ago. Like everybody's like, oh, I only use one workspace. I'm like, how do you only use one workspace? It doesn't make any sense to me. What is wrong with you? Are you are you insane? I, like right now, I, I just start, restarted. I just logged out, logged back in. I mean, you you basically were here with me through that i'm using <laughs> one and six on the first monitor i'm using one three six and nine and i don't have most of the stuff i have usually open so like usually i have LibreOffice open on on two on this monitor and i have you know nemo open up on eight and neo or mutt Mu on one and uh you know, i just have all i have like 19 workspaces and like half of them are full yeah all, all times I mean, my, my workspace is like, I've, I'm not going to go through it, but I've got plenty filled. I've got essentially five workspaces on each monitor, like with stuff going on. I don't understand how someone's like, how do you use a tiling window manager? Like I could understand a floating where you've just got them all stacked over each other. And that's just mm -hmm. how you use your computer. But like in a tiling window manager, if you're using just one workspace, how? Oh yeah. Like when, when I was a KDE user, I never used workspaces at all. Like we just mm -hmm. stack windows on top of each other, and that's just the way you do it. But once you go tiling, you almost have to use workspaces because you you can only split the screen up so many times before you have to use a different workspace. Like, yeah. like I will only put two win two programs or two apps on the same workspace. Like I I don't really want anything more than that. Every once in a while, I'll do three, but three is the I mean, so, some people you see like have like nine or ten terminals on their one you know workspace like what are yeah. you doing you can't read anything there you're not exactly like the, the, i mean we are going to get that comment from that one like weirdo out there who's got like some like 38 inch or like four practically like tv sized 8k mm -hmm. monitor who's like yeah i've got so much screen real estate of course i use just one workspace yeah like, well, i mean i have i have big monitors i have like two 27 inch <laughs> monitors and these are perfectly fine i desperately want a third monitor because that'd give me even more workspaces <laughs> uh, well i mean it'd be great to be able to have you know firefox on one and then obs over here and uh, uh, audacity on the one that'd be so good um, but i just don't have room for it um but yeah yeah i i don't want anything bigger i mean it's i've seen i've seen like if i had like one 48 inch i guess it because it'd be the same size as these but I don't mm -hmm. yeah Probably. <laughs> I just spent 20 minutes on the intro of the show. That's I, how it's I done. Warned, I warned you at the beginning <laughs> that this was going to be the most disorganized Rabbit holes thing galore. Like I, I had... I kept my word. All right, so let's jump into the contact information. <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter at the Linux Cash. You can follow me at tw on Twitter at the MTWB. Uh, Tyler is one of those events that's not on Twitter, but you can follow him on uh, YouTube at the official... You know, he's on... Uh, odyssey at the official zany you can also follow us on, follow him on youtube in the link below um make sure you give him a follow because he has a ton of awesome videos you can subscribe to us and all of our audio feeds and stuff at the linuxcast.org you can contact us via email at the linuxcast at gmail.com and support us on patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast i should take a moment to thank our current patrons sven donnie mitchell maglin camp merrick marcus and devon not in order just i thanked everybody um because for whatever reason, Patreon doesn't sort these in order. Weird. Hmm. Okay. Anyways, and also support us or so, uh, ultra. I can't talk word but damn. Um, <laughs> you can also follow us on YouTube at youtubecom slash linuxcast. <sighs> that's I, I say it every single week. That section needs to get shorter. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Take the breath out of you. <laughs> it's just I tried to get through it as fast as possible. Like we could do it at the end, but then just people would stop listening. So that's mm-hmm. that's the reason why I would do it in the middle. Um. Anyways, so let's move on to the news links of the week. The the news links of the week. So every week we each choose a link that is news, and we share it with each other. So Tyler, what was your news link this week? So mine was on um the new like plasma um mobile update and i found it to be really interesting um just because they they had some cool snapshots in here just of it and i thought the um especially the the music app in it looks really good like really good and apparently this update does come with um some in, in uh performance improvements which as far as i know um stuff like the pine phone desperately needs distros uh to come out with some more performance improvements mm. yeah um, i saw a youtube video of somebody using this on their pine phone it was slow yeah that's that, that, that that's what kills me like i'd love i'd love to get something like the pine phone um because i mean the pine phone's like that, that at that perfect price point like two to three hundred dollars but um the Librem five i mean it's just like 500 bucks and it i yeah, think i th- it's, yeah it, like it's I, like the size of a brick too right so yeah that's the one that's like even i mean the pine phone's not a thin phone but the the libra fine libra, maybe i'm thinking about like a couple of years ago but it was like no it's libra, fat like, the labor five is a fatty boy it, it's thick um but yeah I, I just wish they would um keep doing what they're doing come come out with more performance improvements uh and i don't want to say that we need better hardware for for these types of distros to be like um not just not just really cool but like be extremely usable um but maybe we do because i i really don't see how um they can't get performance to be as good as they can on those devices with as long as they've been out like the pine phone's not new so they've had plenty of time for performance improvements i mean i know con they're going to be constantly coming but um th- this article here i just it-, it got me thinking more about the um the linux phone like market in general um and how it's getting better but i i, I wish it was getting better faster i want a linux phone desperately yeah, I don't know if I want a Linux phone or not. <laughs> like, like, really? I'm big, like, I'm the biggest Linux fanboy you're ever gonna meet. And my biggest problem with the Linux stuff is that it's gonna, even if they get the performance stuff figured out, and I, they will, right? I mean, it's definitely mm-hmm. they will. They'll keep working on it. Uh, the biggest problem is gonna be apps for me, right? Because I use a ton of proprietary stuff, you know, mm-hmm. on my phone, you know, you know, Gmail and there's just, I mean, there's just just a ton of stuff i mean that in games right i mean it's, the phone's the biggest thing where i do any, any gaming so oh uh, really oh, okay so you play uh quite a bit of games on your phone yeah mobile games like uh, clash of clans and you know a ton of stupid time wasting oh. games that are just dumb yeah, and, and that stuff uh, that's never going to come to no like yeah mobile. now the, the ones that are more interesting are the ones where like um the ones that like the east that slash e thing that is basically android but mm-hmm. just they've taken all the google stuff out of that because that can run apks from the play store yeah um now it won't work very well because a lot of the stuff that you know has like pay walls or like they're paid apps so you can't get those apps but um, at least that has some potential like um lineage also has like can use the play store so but i will i will go ahead and say the problem with those types of Android dev- like OSs is removing the Google Play services will brick a lot of those. Like, I mean, you're talking about Clash of yeah. Clans. Like, I'm 99% sure that uses Google Play services. Oh, so I'm, sh- I'm sure. Like on the slash e stuff, a lot of that stuff's not going to work with. But at least, at least there, you have some access to some of the Android stuff. Yeah. Um, now there are there are like. Uh, uh, there are um, lost the word. Uh, the pro there are pro fuck's sake projects. <laughs> projects is the fucking word. There are projects out there that allow you to run Android apps on Linux. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
if they can get those to work so that you can also use them on something like plasma mobile that'd be really cool um well but just to shoot down like so you you said google email couldn't you use thunderbird on like a linux that was just one that i one that i mentioned i mean they're just yeah. there's tons of, i could get yeah. you really want to I see like because like w w when I've thought about it when it comes to my Linux phone now the gaming point is uh, th that's a big one like I agree with you there that's not uh, that's a big like one Spotify is probably not going to be on there right away okay um, yeah true true uh, there's tons of like, shopping and food apps on there that I have on there uh, tons of social like Instagram and you know, you know like Facebook you could probably go and just use the web version but yeah. like, Instagram they have a web version but you can't post to it um, true same th thing with like um, I don't know Dang it, uh, man! You're sh you're shooting down my arguments. <laughs> right. right. Like, I mean, we're gonna have podcast apps and stuff on there, which eventually show up. But the there are just these other little little apps that you just use all the time that are just never ever going to come there, right? And no. I mean, it, it's taken 35, 40 years now for Linux to get to the point where we have apps on linux like the desktop linux that can actually go say you want to run? i can switch away from windows and use linux full time and not have any problems with anything like um obviously there's a transition period and learning curve or whatever but if it i don't the the mobile market moves so fast i don't know if they have 35 or 40 years to get to the point where they can actually go through and you know uh, wait for actually compete yeah because yeah. um, by the time you get to 35 40 years from now we're not going to be using cell phones i mean we're going to have things implanted into our brains and yeah. flying cars they've been promising us flying fucking cars forever we're going to have them damn it um we need them we <laughs> <yeah>. deserve them <laughs> <laughs> all right um so my link was this whole thing going on with the university of minnesota first of all big 10 school uh, so you really can't be surprised that they're shady as fuck. I'm just saying, um, and, and that's coming from, you know, my alma mater's mission. My uh, give a fuck. I cannot talk with a damn alma mater. I can talk. I went to Michigan State, so I'm a product of a Big Ten school. Uh, but so uh, I'm not gonna go through. I mean, chances are, if you're in the Linux sphere, you've heard of this thing where, basically, uh, University of Minnesota and specifically some grad students and a professor went through and submitted a whole bunch of faulty insecure patches to linux kernel they got caught uh basically what they were trying to do is penetration testing and basically the rule number one of penetration testing is that you don't do it anonymous, anonymously you ask permission from someone somewhere like that is the most basic of like any professor that should like if he's going to teach a course on penetration testing that's the most basic that's not just the 101 that's like the first sentence that they explain yeah it's like but it's Permission. the title of the freaking textbook is what it is, <laughs> it is right you, know, you always ask something i mean the whole company doesn't have to know like the the whole like everybody in the, every maintainer didn't have to know they were going to be tested but you go to like you want to say hey linus We'd like to test something and see how secure the process is. And, you know, he's either going to say, fuck you, or he's going to let you do it. Right. Yeah. And then he, that way, when you get caught, you don't have to go through and have these problems of looking like you're doing something wrong because you want, you have permission from the dude. You know? Exactly. And it didn't even have to be lines. It could have been this Greg Cage guy or any of the other maintainers. Anyone could have talked to just right. anyone. Um, so who, I mean, like I said, the link's going to be in the show notes, but basically, if you haven't heard, the Linux, the University of Minnesota is now banned from committing to the Linux kernel, like, probably not forever, but for, until they've gone through and regained the trust of the, the, the Linux community. So, they're kind of screwed because, I mean, I mean, when you're studying computer science, one of the things that you're probably going to focus on, especially if you're going to be looking for those kind of certifications and stuff is stuff to do with the Linux kernel and Linux development and stuff like that. And now you can't do anything unless you do it outside of, you know, your school email domains. And chances are they'll probably find you out then too. So, yeah. And, um, as far as I know, like I, I, I'm pretty sure that schools work on like at least most curriculums, I believe like in schools, require you to like on projects to use your school like address for stuff to be able to like track you know what you're what you're doing and how you did it and stuff like yeah. that so i don't i 
I don't know how big of an issue this is for the school, like internally and the students, but it has to be a problem at the very least a problem, mm -hmm. if not a big one. Well, yeah, it's so. going to be the students that get punished for us. Basically it's not probably not that one professor that decided, Oh, this is a good idea. Yeah. I mean, it makes zero sense. I mean, the, the, regardless of the amount of work that it caused for the Linux maintainers, in the end, this is just a huge ordeal for the school because it makes them look very inept and like uh, just the well, they don't have the ability to teach. It makes their review board or whatever that reviewed the process because the, the professor did go to a review board. Granted, he went to it after he'd already done the research. So, I mean, that's first of all, um, I don't think that that's processed the way you're supposed to go through and get things approved. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, he did. The review board said it was, you know, perfectly fine. And then he said, I was the, the the professor thought it was perfectly fine. So you know, it makes him look like a dumbass. I mean, yeah, because I mean, I it makes zero sense. Because I mean, insecure, like everything I know about penetration testing, there is there or or any type of test like this, a security test you have to get permission beforehand like in any case you, there's not an, an argument it's, it's an attack <laughs> yeah what it is it's, like, you you can't try to hack into a bank right without permission and say well you, at, at, when you get caught say oh no i was just trying to test your firewall i was doing you a favor like yeah. no you were trying to steal all the money <laughs> yeah <laughs> like <laughs> and the the argument they use like so um i I did a video on it, but the, the, their apology letter, like they, after the apology, they, they go through and like, maybe their argument is they're not justifying it, but it's very clear they're justifying what they did. And I'm like, for one, if you, if you, if you apologize, then immediately start like justifying or, or like giving good reasons for why you did what you did. You just ruined the apology in the first right. place. Um, but in the apology, like they, it, it's weird because they, they use the excuse of, well, if we told you it would, it would change how they looked at it. And, that's that's not an argument like in any other case where you're where you're doing any type of testing like you can't make that argument or doing right. a study or anything it's still not an ethical excuse like you have to talk to somebody <laughs> well, well right that's the thing i was like you know ne you never have to tell every i mean obviously yes if you told everybody that would ruin the experiment mm -hmm. um that's that's a reasonable argument but the that's you have to get permission otherwise like i said it's just an attack it's 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 you you're, you're just being an asshole uh, so yeah it, that's definitely dumb but i have a feeling that this is not a one-off thing i bet you there are other universities that said that this was you know okay um mm -hmm. and probably just didn't get caught or or at least hadn't done it yet or something so maybe this there's some good that will come out of this and saying you want to hey you want to maybe First of all, we'll, we'll we'll follow the ethics and rule book of 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 testing, and mm -hmm. maybe the Linux kernels guys will actually learn some things too. Like, um, you know, they'll go through and somehow revamp the process a little bit so that maybe some of this stuff doesn't get through so easily. Oh. Like, so a lot of this stuff got caught with, like in the email threads and stuff, but you know, mm -hmm. some of it didn't. So, yeah, maybe, I know a big problem of it too is like just they weren't really focusing on them because they were a school. So like, you know, that type of thing just yeah, you maybe don't, you now don't, you, don't you don't expect malicious software to come from Minnesota. I mean, yeah. Minnesota is basically Canada, and Canada <laughs> Canada is supposedly really nice. So obviously, the Minnesota people are really nice. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. Huh. Um, that's, that's like the, the faultiest logic ever. Like yeah. Minnesota's close to Canada, so it's basically Canada. So Canada and Canada's nice. So obviously Minnesota's nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that being said, <laughs> still, I mean, it sounded you, you, better in my head. Okay. <laughs> uh, we do have to move on to the main. Yeah. <laughs> it does not. It, we're we're uh, an almost an hour into this, and we're just getting to the main topic. I'm just saying this is. <laughs> all right tyler this was your topic so tell us what we're talking about i still have no clue automatic updates in in linux good or bad 
Um, I so want to like hear your opinion. That, the things that like um, the Linux Mint fake people were talking about doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you immediately switch distros if whichever distro you use decided to start doing automatic updates? If I couldn't turn it off, yes. Um, okay. All right. So I guess it would depend. All right. So first of all, I, what I said first stands, right? As long as you can turn it off, I think it's still kind of dumb, but I can understand it. But it makes a whole lot more sense on Linux Mint than it does, like, say, let's say Arch Linux decided they were going to do this. That is <laughs> everybody off, right? Because yeah. Arch, Arch Linux is not a, a, a is not a user or a new user distro. It's meant for people who actually have used Linux before, right? So, yeah, I I, I think the whole con I think the context is important for for Linux Mint who who are t- specifically targeting new users automatic updates is probably a good thing but i do think like i said that it needs to be able to be turned off so like ubuntu has automatic updates already they've had it for two or three years and Mm -hmm. i don't think anybody i'm chances are if you use ubuntu you probably don't even know because they Mm -hmm. install the security updates in the background they never tell you Mm -hmm. like it's just done um but everything that's bigger and stuff like that they'll obviously they'll ask you yeah. I think that that's kind of shady. Like they have that welcome screen or whatever, where they ask you if you are okay sending information back to Canonical. I think mm-hmm. they should also on that thing ask you, "Hey, you want? Do you want us to do security updates in the background? Yes or no? Mm-hmm. You can you can have the the yes checkbox checked by default, but it still is something that you should ask. Even so, you a- are fine with opt in, like. Or or, or um opt the, the opt out like mentality. I, I think as long as you know about it as long as they're up front and say you want hey we're going to do this and we're going to have it turned on by default you can turn it off um if you want to and you know we think that this is important so we're going to put it right we're just going to be right in your face about it and say hey this is what we're going to do uh this is how this is how you turn it off uh you know even just give like a like right at the i mean all these things have welcome screens just put it right in in a welcome screen say you know, we prefer you to do security updates to keep your computer secure. This, this, this functionality is on by you know default. Uh, if you prefer not to, here's the off button. Yeah, it's literally all they have to do. Now, like I said, that makes sense on Ubuntu and it makes sense in Linux Mint. Uh, outside of those two distros, I don't think it makes sense at all. Like yeah. so. Um, even the other flavors of Ubuntu, I don't think this that, that, that it makes sense because those yeah. those are much more focused on people who have used Linux before. I think, or at least that's the way I feel. Or, or at least they've used Ubuntu. Like, yeah, yeah. they've used Ubuntu. They've gotten familiar with it, and they're like, I want something a little I, bit. I, I want to try more KDE like me. or I want to try Mate or something like that. Chances yeah. are, those people have, are at least a little bit more experienced with Linux, and, and, and in which case, it should be off by default. And uh, maybe then maybe they can still prompt you to turn it on. Uh, yeah. But I feel like those people should be more, have more control over their things than like a new user. So, like I just switched my dad to Ubuntu mm-hmm. and I turned, cause he hate one of the things he hated about his windows install was that it asked him to do updates all the time. Like that's what everybody hates, you know, to do updates on windows. I mean, it's the number one reason was why windows sucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's also why so many people who use windows are running a out of date, um, windows version with like plenty of security holes in it well so like just don't want to do it windows 10 now won't let you actually run an out-of-date thing if you if you run windows 10 it keeps you up to date whether you want to or not you can delay updates for like seven days but after that you have to do them like whether you want to or not Uh, i think even aware of that yeah i I, now if linux went that far so like when this (laughs) linux mint thing came out they made it sound like because they used the word insist um, Ooh. Yeah, they 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 said they were going to. These obviously this is paraphrasing, but they said they were going to develop a way of doing automatic updates, and we're going to insist that people do them. Insist, and that's that. Insist implies force. Yeah, right? and that's that's yeah. gonna, that. I think when this the the Linux Mint thing first came out, that pissed a lot of people off. I did a mm-hmm. video on it. Um, and, and I can understand that why. I think that was 
mostly that was just a, a, a language thing. Like they shouldn't have used that word. That's not, cause that's not really what they're going to do. They're, yeah. they're developing a, a, mess, a mechanism similar to what Ubuntu does that does automatic updates, but you can easily turn it off. Mm-hmm. But I think that if Linux went through and say, you want to, we're doing the updates, whether you fucking like it or not, mm-hmm. uh, that everybody's was, not gonna like yeah, it we'd all find whoever made that decision and lynch them in the street <laughs> um, yeah i i don't think yeah. that see like that's that's the 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 freak out i think everyone had over automatic updates was strictly to do with the wording there and the thought that okay well now linux is going to force me to do an update which I will give Linux this much, even in an environment where like somehow the Linux community is like, we want automatic updates and we like them forced on us. Like even in that type of world, at least when you're doing an update on a Linux system, as, as long as the distro doesn't for some reason decide to do this, you can still use the operating system. And when it's done, it's not a forced reboot and needs to do more afterwards. Like there's none, none, none of that crap. So like, I mean, even if, that world existed where we all wanted that i it would still be better than windows but i don't think anyone's petitioning for that type of reality yeah i don't think i don't think so either I, I, and like i said i don't think linux mint was doing that either i think they were more focused on the fact that, well you want to know what there are still people using uh, versions of linux mints that are four years old mm-hmm. and these things have se- severe security support and we don't want to support these things forever so we're gonna yeah set up a mechanism where things are updated automatically uh but you know you have the ability to turn it off i the, the, i think the only sn- snag that they're going to face is if they don't put it up front you know like yeah because they're making this change you know if they do it in the background then it's kind of shady right if, mm-hmm. as long as they put it up front and say you know what, here we're doing this uh turn it off if you want to i think yeah. that i think that's perfectly fine now like i said earlier if this was arch fuck off leave me to do my no. updates on my own right that's <laughs> like not I, gonna fly like i want to I, I do my updates once every nine days and that's how often i'll do them and I, I, I manage my updates i don't want anyone else right. doing it for exactly. me exactly i don't uh, but in the in the linux dis or linux mint and like ubuntu world though not most people who are using that distro aren't you know, they picked it in the first place because it was stable and it wasn't going to have any problems. And a lot of people who use it, I mean, like, let's be honest, most Linux people like us install it for family members and they just use it on and off. And not everybody has, you know, like, like my mom is a unique scenario where she literally has me around all the time. So her Ubuntu install gets updates, even though it just pops up and asks her from time to time, Hey, do you want to do an update? immediately closes it never does it i do it for yeah, see, not everyone that, does that when i switched my dad to ubuntu i turned that notification off i said never check for updates mm-hmm. um because i know it would just piss him off right it would just, yeah <laughs> like it would just make him mad so i went through and just you know i turned that off and you know once every six months or whatever i'll go through and do pseudo apt update you know yeah it won't be a big deal yeah. um because I mean, all he does is put together jigsaw puzzles and watch YouTube videos. It's not as if he's on there doing online banking or trading stocks or whatever. He he, he doesn't need any security. Yeah. <laughs> he, he he like he he has no personal information on there at all, and his email address that he uses is in a fake name, so he's perfectly fine. <laughs> you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> My mom does her banking on it, so I like to keep it updated yeah. just so she doesn't have an update like or an out of date browser. Um, and the good thing about her is we've turned it into a joke with how many times she can close an update window. Because like in Ubuntu, I, um, you can set the like um, time period that you're going to get, like like it'll check for updates and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so like she gets one, I think I think it's like once a week or something like that. It, it, it's not like a crazy one, but the amount of times like I'll I'll check in on it's been a couple months since I've checked in on the laptop, and she's like, "Yep, haven't haven't done an update, just." Nope, I, I see the updates. Don't want to do them. I'm like, it always cracks me up with her because I'm like, well, you could just press the update and then just do something else. Nah, nah, that's too I, much. I, I think when when you're like that, you just you're worried that you're gonna break something. You and when you're not like, I mean, I gotta call our parents luddites because they, they're not. They use computers, but they don't. 
if something goes wrong, they're not going to know how to fix it. So they worry yeah. about that scenario, and that's perfectly okay because half the time when I do updates, I break things. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so yeah. I mean, this kind of crap happens to everybody. Um, you know, I was thinking the the new way of doing like the way Ubuntu does updates in terms of like security and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that, that it, it would be it, it is kind of the perfect way for like new new Linux distros or new user focused Linux distros to do it. Um, but I don't remember when they went through and did that. If they did that just behind the scenes, because I think I feel like they did. Like they didn't mm -hmm. just like I don't feel like they went through and said, "Hey, you know, we're." I mean, only like people like you and me would know that they went through and did the said we we're going to turn automatic updates on but mm -hmm. like your mom and my dad we're never going to figure that out like they have no clue yeah. right so um i i was thinking if when linux may go through goes through and does this they decide to do it in the background maybe that's a good thing i mean he, maybe he said, he, he see said, that's the thing maybe like i i mean because if for that type of user if they went through and said after an update and then you know sometimes after an update you get the welcome screen again if they went through and said you know we're all of a sudden doing this they'd maybe cause some upset amongst those type of people who don't understand why uh these, these things are going to be doing being done in the background especially like i feel like they're uh, the thing about Ubuntu that sort of makes sense in, in, in the way that they didn't make it like a public, like opt-in thing or just like automatic updates, like labeling it like that, when it's clearly just for security things and put in the background, they Ubuntu is that weird use case where there's enough people that aren't familiar with exactly how the computer even works at all. So maybe that is a good like a good way of not confusing a large portion of their user base yeah it's it's like doing something nefarious for the greater good oh god Let's yeah use dumbledore um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um i don't i don't know it, it's an interesting moral quandary because you want as many people to update as possible and the autumn it'd be so tempting for these distros to say you want to we're just going to do the updates in the background Screw mm -hmm. this. We're going to take control. So it'd be so. I mean, that's basically what Windows has done, right? Is they've gone through and said, "You want to? We got so sick of people using Internet Explorer six for ten years. We're just updating everybody. You get no choice." Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I feel and I hope and I'm pretty sure that Linux is never going to go that extreme. But at the same point, you they still going to want to keep as many people at least in terms of the security updates updated as much as much as possible so there ha there's the whole idea of a happy middle ground there somewhere yeah. uh, where that i still feel being upfront about it probably is the best way to go about it uh say hey you know we're going to do this uh you know here's how you turn it off kind of thing uh but i don't think i necessarily have a horrible problems with certain distros that are meant for new users again uh doing it in the background even without telling anybody um as that, odd as that sounds it does it does yeah. sort of make sense like it feels like the most anti-foss thing i've ever said and it probably <laughs> is um, yeah. <laughs> but right but you know it just you you can't um, the most of the people who will be affected by it would be new users and those mm -hmm. people aren't ever going to do updates on their own anyways. Now, mm -hmm. again, I, as long as long as there's a, a way to turn it off, because whoever installed Linux for yeah. them in the first place can at least turn that stuff off, and yeah. they would know better. So, yeah. um, I don't know. It's, it's a, like I said, it's an interesting moral yeah. thing. Because, I mean, I, I foresee plenty of new users seeing automatic updates and assuming it means programs, everything. Computers going to have to reboot after well, it. And just... That changes. Like, I mean, uh, you get past 50 or 60 years old, you mm -hmm. hate change with a passion of a thousand burning suns. You cannot mm -hmm. stand the fact that something changes. Um, mm -hmm. And you never, ever, ever want something to change. Um, and mm -hmm. it's especially true with anything technological, right? I mean, you, you can understand, you know, if something in the real world changes, cause stuff like that, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're using a piece of technology that you don't understand in the first place, yeah, uh, you, you just use because you want to go to 
yahoo.com and you understand mm -hmm. that part of the technology thing, but you don't understand anything else. You don't want a new start menu to pop up. You don't want GNOME 40 to all of a sudden show up. Hey, my icons were over here the other day and now my icons are down here. Mm -hmm. You don't even want your like panel to like change the tint. It is like, yeah, yeah, you don't want new icons. You don't want anything. Any change is bad. Um, and we'll be like that someday, Tyler. <laughs> we will, oh, we'll be like that someday. Sadly, we will. <laughs> like, I'm kind of like that now. I don't want anything to change unless I change it. You know? Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I want that, ch I want that changed in control. So that's, that's a, I mean, that's the biggest thing about, if you're going to do automatic updates, it has to be just the security stuff. It can't be new big features because it would, that would, that would know that's just not yeah. going to work for people because like i said it's it's going to be that it's going to be that type of person i mean they're not they're not even all old people i mean i said old older people but um i mean there's 20 there's 20 year olds i know who yeah. are like s scared of messing with a, a mac because they might break stuff and i'm like literally designed even, to be easy even to use. break a mac i mean <laughs> is that even i possible? have no idea <laughs> <laughs> okay um Let's go ahead and talk about our apps of the week. Tyler, what's your app of the week this week? My app of the week, I started the podcast off talking about IRC. So it's HexChat, which is a really nice IRC client. Um, I, I've been using It's great. Um, I mean, it's as simple as an IRC chat client. I feel like not just can be, but should be. It's, it's nothing special. It's not too crazy. Um, and uh, one good thing that I will say about it is it's it's nice to have an IRC chat because I have been going back and forth with quite a few people in IRC chat. It doesn't use Dunst or anything to send you notifications. So you don't get bu like barraged with notifications um, through a chat client, which oddly enough, I'm super thankful for, even though like I, I, I'll if I'm doing something else, it'll take me a while to respond. I just won't know if I've needed to or, or, or anything or seen anything. I'm not getting like 15 notifications every five minutes. And that is a very, very generous estimate of how many I would be getting through IRC. Um, so I don't know. Um, do, do you use um, IRC at all? One time. <laughs> um, I'm... I just didn't see in like maybe it was just because I was in the wrong like rooms or whatever, but I just didn't mm -hmm. see um, as much activity on there as like I spend most of my time with that, that kind of stuff in like Telegram. I like I prefer the Telegram groups, but because it just feels uh -huh. more modern stuff. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I didn't spend much time. I did a video on it and then I kind of left it behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of Telegram, I've had quite a few people try and get like now are getting me off of Telegram like don't use telegram like you shouldn't use telegram it's centralized and proprietary and but, but telegram's like, open source i mean i don't understand i gotta understand telegram is completely open source as far as i know it's so here's the thing it's open source but um the telegram server software is not so like um and they also store um everything in apparently plain text documents as far as I could tell, or as far as I was told, um, put it that way. Um, so apparently signal is way like way better than telegram, but, yeah, but it's horrible. Ass. It's new to it's exactly. Ass exactly. Oh. Martin and, and I use signal for a little while and it just the app on Linux is just so, I mean, it's an open source project and you'd think that that would mean that their open source app on Linux would be, you know, good. But mm -hmm. it's, it's not. It's not good. It's it's really bad. Like, it, it, like especially on like tiling, it, it, it's not so bad if you're using like a, a desktop environment. But if you're on a tiling window manager, and you try to like make it smaller, it's like not responsive. So it actually like, cuts stuff off. It's it's not good. Hmm. We end up switching to WhatsApp. <laughs> That's how bad that was. Um, Dang. Because because he wouldn't use Telegram. So or we had problems with Telegram. I don't even really really remember. Um, mm. But I use Telegram all the time. Like. We talked about proprietary software before, and like I don't, I mean, mm -hmm. it's like not as if I'm going to go through me, you know, telling state secrets or giving banking information over Telegram. So yeah, I don't really, I, I don't know if I, I don't know about the whole storing things in plain text thing. If that's true, that's kind of scary. But um, if that's, I mean, I, I don't see how that. I mean, 
if that's really again like I, that's what i told people i'm like i use telegram just to talk to you about the podcast like if if our entire like text chain like or like entire chat just became public the worst thing would be like oh no they just have my audio of the podcast or like like yeah. it wouldn't be that bad like it did there's nothing really private that i'm worried about in using telegram like i feel like there's and it, my, my argument was the same thing with discord if you're not worried about stuff like you, you know like if you're just using it and you wouldn't care if it became public i don't really see a problem with that but that was my app of the week Hex, well, hex chat and irc <laughs> yeah no, um all right so mine is also an, kind of an oldie but a goodie is news boat so i've been trying to be a little bit more uh cohesive in terms of taking news in instead of going you know visiting the verge four times a day visiting you know these things all the time i just kind of want one place to check all the news mm -hmm. kind of all the time so uh i've kind of gotten back into the whole rss thing so i i installed news but i've used it before several times and it's really good so if you you like a terminal based rss feed reader Newsboat is probably the best solution. There are GUI options for stuff like this, but if you're a nerd like me and, and you prefer using things in the terminal, Newsboat is kind of awesome. Um, now, in terms of using RSS on mobile, I haven't found a good one yet. So that's something that I'm still looking for. Uh, um, um, the problem with a lot of the, R the RSS feed readers on like Android is they're either ad-based, and there's nothing wrong with being ad-based. The problem mm -hmm. comes in when you're pushy with your ads like you yeah. put them all over the damn place and you can't dismiss them like i'll pay for your app, your app if it's good to get rid of the ads um, mm -hmm. a lot of them won't even do that so um that, yeah, that, i've that, actually never even tried getting rss on my phone i don't even know the quality of uh, of apps that you get there so that's it's interesting well, to hear yeah. that there aren't any good options well, iphone has one has apps that are way better but that's just kind of true across the board yeah Apple does that good, good, good job of curating their uh, their apps and making sure that they uh, get de developers. If you're going to make something niche, that's fine, but it has to be quality. Well, then people and developers are more willing to develop for iOS because uh, you know people actually make money on iOS and on and Android. You don't make any money. <laughs> like, it, like, yeah. like you can make money if as long as you're like you know. Uh, EA, you know, yeah. or something. But yeah. if, if you're just a, a random, really small developer, it's really a lot harder to develop on Android and make cash without using like an abundance of ads, right? Like, yeah. Because nope, people on Android just are a million times less willing to pay for things, uh, unless they're in-app purchases for Clash of Clans, in which case I've spent way too much money. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's just so true. Uh, and I'm I'm talking hundreds of dollars. It's it's what it, it's dumb I gotta remember i've been playing it now for 10 years oh okay so it's over, okay it's over okay. A, it's over a course of 10 years and i, I okay. i've had two accounts so like i i met i maxed out one account you know I, i'm starting over again so and i don't, and I don't do it uh, all the time like i spent 20 dollars every three months or something it's not yeah it's not something horrible it's usually when they have a sale <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like, like so they're having a sale i've got to buy it. it's on sale all right Holy shit, that was a long effing podcast. Um <laughs> but it was a good one. It was I told you rabbit holes and we gave you rabbit holes. It, right, so, there were good rabbit holes too. Yes, we talked about some good stuff. Now coming up next week, we're gonna be talking oh it's gonna be a good one. We're gonna talk about mint or ubuntu. Which one is better for noobs? That's gonna be the topic for next week. Oh people are gonna get heated in the comments over it. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and there's going to be that one jerk in the, co in the comment section named Matt, who says, use arch. It's better for everybody. <laughs> use arch. Beginners <laughs> on arch. Everyone starts off with arch. It, dude, it's pronounced Manjaro. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. Anyways, that's coming up next week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Subscribe and like, see you next week. See ya.